wacky and weird, Bumblebee? That's the list we have for you today. Welcome back to the channel for today's video on the top 10 mad scientists who changed history. Since it's literally in the name, Oppenheimer will be oppening this list at number 10. Yeah, you can hate me in the comments for that one. So, born into a bread and butter white picket fence family in 1904, J. Robert Oppenheimer's bland start fueled his drive for knowledge, and he excelled in a broad range of subjects. He earned a Harvard degree in 1925 and a doctorate from Gottingen in 1927, and he took on a joint position between Caltech and Berkeley in 1930. The bulk of Oppenheimer's work during these eras of his life focused on the blossoming field of quantum mechanics, specifically experimental nuclear physics. The fall of France in 1940 horrified him, and he felt a deep obligation to join the American forces as a result. Oppenheimer was appointed the leader of the Manhattan Project in early 1942 and began searching for the brightest nuclear physicists, chemists, and engineers in the United States. What makes Oppenheimer a mad scientist isn't the fact that he achieved probably the only technological achievement that rivaled the computer using only theoretical principles since they were too broke for real supplies. It was actually A, he recognized what they were creating and the extent of it, but proceeded to because he felt it was the right thing to do to take vengeance. B, the misconception he regrets dropping that thing, he doesn't. As stated, Oppenheimer felt it was a correct for vengeance. He does, however, regret creating something that began the arms race of all arms race and encouraged bigger and more deadly weaponry that humanity wouldn't understand the extent of nor be able to control. And C, he chose a test site, aka Trinity, for the NB that was populated by indigenous people. It was not unpopulated and the film is actually perpetuating this inaccuracy. The Trinity site is more than 200 miles away from Los Alamos in White Sands, New Mexico. And what people weren't forced off their land for a mere seven dollars from the government were still there when the NB was tested. If I have to explain to you why that warrants being dubbed a mad scientist, we got some other problems here. All right, well, that's a bummer to start with. Let's try and lighten things up with number nine, alien seedlings. See, doesn't that sound so promising? But it starts off relatively normal at first. So along with James D. Watson, Francis Crick will forever be remembered as one of the discoverers of the very structure of DNA. February 28th of 1953, which made Crick climb up out of his seat and declare to the assembled lunch patrons at the Eagle that they had found the secret of life. The two men had met while they were working together at the University of Cambridge, and in 1962, they received a Nobel Prize for their scientific work. A coin toss between the two of them had decided the order in which they would even be named as authors. But you can learn more about this in the Bumblebee video, the top 10 most significant scientific breakthroughs in history. And maybe while you're at it, subscribe to The Hive to see more of the Bumblebee science videos. Anyways, Crick was arguably amongst the finest minds in science, which is what makes his later beliefs a little bit more difficult to fathom. At some point in the 1970s, Crick became an advocate of one of the weirdo pseudoscience theories of all times. He called it direct panspermenia, and it's the premises that life on Earth was deliberately seeded by aliens. However, this theory states how life spread, not how life began. Crick and Leslie Orgel proposed their directed panspermia theory at a conference on communication with extraterrestrial intelligence in 1971, a theory they described as highly unorthodox proposal and a bold speculation as they presented it as a plausible scientific hypothesis. Crick repeatedly addressed this question and the origin of life between 1971 and 1988. On to number eight, we have these scientists who love to make them dance. In the world of scientists, Giovanni Aldini was a punk rocker with a lip piercing you wouldn't want to take home to mom. At a time when electricity was still a new invention, Aldini traveled across Europe with the sole purpose of electrifying subjects. This may sound horrific, and it was, but it was all in the pursuit of science, as explained by science historian Ewan Morris. He'd spent most of the last decade working to exonerate his uncle, the great Luigi Galvani, who had been dismissed from the faculty at the University of Bologna, hilarious, for refusing to swear alliance to Napoleon. After losing his position, he died penniless a year later. Aldini's mission was to prove his uncle's theory of galvanism, or the medical use of electricity, to stimulate nerves and muscles. And in that mission, Aldini became an entertainer who gave audiences a rare spectacle of witnessing what happens to corpses when they're electrocuted. In a demonstration, Aldini would attach electric nodes to observe how the body reacts. When attached to a human head or an ox head, the facial muscles would contort, the teeth would chatter, the eye sockets even pop out. When the body was involved, limbs and parts moved in motion, giving the impression that the organism was reanimating. Yet besides his antics, Aldini was one of the few scientists that actually does manage to learn to cure mental illness with electroshocks. His curious and interesting experiments indicated the power of electricity in science. It's in the name, y'all. Number seven will be Mad Match. We need a lady on the list, and why not do one 
who may as well have been the Judas Shakespeare, centuries before Virginia Woolf exhorted women to find a room of one's own. Essentially, she wasn't mad, she was just a woman, that's all there is to it. Margaret Cavendish was one of the first women to write using her own name and the only woman to publish her own natural philosophy in the 17th century. And she's also the first woman to be invited to the newly formed Royal Society. Madge was a controversial figure in the 17th century, but despite the scandal her writing life caused, she had a grand total of 13 books ranging from poems and fancies, the first book of poetry published by a woman under her own name, to Blazing World, the first science fiction by a woman. She acquired a reputation for eccentricity as well. In addition to her writing, she designed her own clothes, swore like a trucker, and was a friendly flirt despite her very, very loving marriage to William Cavendish, who paid for all of her publications. As a result, Cavendish was often called Mad Madge, but Madge wasn't crazy. As said, she was just a very intelligent woman in an anti-intelligent women era, and maybe a little socially inept. On one occasion, Cavendish was pondering upon the natures of mankind, to quote her, and decided to write down all the positive qualities possessed by one of her friends on a piece of paper, and on another, all of her friend's negative qualities. Cavendish then decided to send her friend the list of positive qualities as a kind gesture, which she assumed would be appreciated. Unfortunately, she accidentally sent the wrong list and sent her homegirl a list of her worst flaws. Naturally, said friend was pretty furious. Number six is zany and brainy. It's the notorious Nikola Tesla. So, he attended the Austrian Polytechnic in Graz, but never graduated, and potentially really was the most inventive and zaniest scientist who ever lived. Some of his saner research included extensive work on AC electrical current and studies involving x-rays. When not producing bolts of artificial lightning that measured up to 135 feet long to kill elephants, if you don't know the story of Topsy, take to the internet, or watch the weirdly accurate but also hilarious Bob's Burgers cartoon episode about it. Tesla worked on inventions such as the particle gun that he believed might bring down tens of thousands of airplanes, or anti-gravity flying machines. As he got older, Tesla's OCD condition did worsen and it began to amalgamate with his scientific side more than ever. Mental obsessions are often associated with behavioral compulsions performed according to rigid rules. Tesla felt driven to perform repetitive behaviors such as doing everything in sets of three, but also developed habits and aversions such as calculating the cubic contents of all the food on his plate before eating, or a touch phobia to human hair. Famously, the renowned inventor believed he had been in contact with extraterrestrials from Venus, and he also managed to fall head over heels in love with a pigeon of whom he insisted felt mutually. And now moving on to the creepiest guy on this list, the brain implant guy is number five. University of Madrid graduate Jose Delgado may have received a prestigious professorship at Yale University, but his research at the venerable institution's physiology department was, I don't know, the makings of a complete movie level supervillain? Like microchips in the brain lets control humanity type of vibe? In 1950s and 60s, Delgado inserted electro implants into the brains of primates and used a remote control that gave off radio frequencies to make the animals perform complicated movements in arms, legs, and face. Later, Delgado decided to be even more insane. He implanted this into the brain of a bull, which he then got into a ring with, pissed it off, and then used the transmitter to stop the bull dead in its tracks when it charged at him. Terrifying stuff. Perhaps most alarmingly of all, Delgado also wired up the brains of 25 people. 25 people let this guy in their skull. Behaviorally, this device only impacted people's aggression, but he kept striving for a way to achieve mind control, because as this supervillain once stated, we must electronically control the brain. Someday armies and generals will be controlled by electric stimulation. And what better way to follow that up than with nymphs and giants? Number four. Paracelius, just one name like Cher or Madonna, was a learned man of the Renaissance, earning a doctorate from the Uni of Ferrara in the early 16th century. Seen as the father of modern toxology, Paracelius was a practicing physician, botanist, and occultist, the latter of which can be given direct credit for his weird stunt experiments. Paracelius was convinced that he could create a living homo nucleus, a tiny man, by keeping man juice in a warm place and feeding it his human blood. He even left instructions for any others who might wish to try it and fervently believed that this method was the genesis of wood nymphs and giants. Science may have been a lot less advanced 100 years ago, but this was still a pretty bizarre hypothesis then. Number three was willing to do anything, evidently. It's the Dino Diner. William Buckland, graduate of Corpus Christi College, Oxford, a contemporary of Charles Darwin, remembered as the first man to pen a complete description of a fossilized dinosaur, the Megalosaurus, and an aspiring Anthony B 
Bourdain? If you could eat it with less of an 80% chance of it killing you, William Buckland put it in his mouth. Like the world's craziest oral fixation, this man ate a list that included roast hedgehog, potted ostrich, panthers, porpoises, puppies, bugs, cockroaches, snakes, and even bat urine. Garden moles, though, were apparently a bridge too far because they were ugly, so there was no way that could taste good. However, perhaps Buckland's greatest gustatory achievement was reportedly having eaten the shrunken heart of King Louis XIV, a distinction arguably that overshadows his account of the Megalosaurus, if it's true. Number two is about these two peas in a space pod. So the story of rocket scientist Jack Parsons is so monumentally insane that it's tempting to think that Quentin Tarantino is pulling another fast one on us. But somehow, this California Institute of Technology researcher's personal life is real and wildly well documented. The crazy train starts in 1939 when Parsons very, very suddenly converted to Thelema, a philosophy religion developed by the famed Aleister Crowley. I talked about this religion in the recent Bumblebee video, Historic Sorcerers, that actually had powers if you do want to learn more. Parsons, together with his occult roomies, were spotted many times, nakedly dancing around fires in his garden. And because crazy knows no bound, Jack Parsons went from Aleister Crowley type of crazy to Tom Cruise kind of crazy. Oh yeah, that's right, Jack joined up with Scientology founder L. Robert Hubbard. Why? Oh, you know, just to raise the mother of the Antichrist. Yeah, if you guys don't really know what Scientology is, your favorite celebrities believe in crap like raising Antichrist mothers. Go enjoy Handmaiden's Tale now that you know that. So, to raise an Antichrist mother scientifically, of course, because this is science, Parsons yanked his proverbial chain? Well, Hubbard wrote notes on it. A moment of silence, please. Then, then, the pair also believed that they could summon spirits while Hubbard intoned next to Parsons having intercourse with his side piece. And then when Hubbard later absconded with Parsons' side piece, the scientist reported that he was trying to hex his foe. All of this wild malarkey thankfully comes to an end when Parsons was sadly eventually killed in an explosion, but some have suggested that it was actually caused by a magic experiment. And what better way to finish off than with number one, the monkey man. You may be wondering, what could be crazier than Jack Parsons' escapades? Well, Soviet biologist Ilya Ivanov is here and he says to hold his vodka. In 1924, the Bolshevik government granted Ivanov permission to leave the country for the express governmentally funded purpose of breeding hybrid ape humans. So let's go over this again. The government gave a scientist money and resources and everyone agreed it was to make a half human, half ape. This, this is real. And then in the summer of 1926, Ivanov, now in Paris, grafted a woman's ovary into a chimp named Nora and tried to, you know, get her pregnant with some injected human man stuff. Sorry, y'all ain't got a better allowable name for it, so just work with me here. In November that year, still being 1926, I'm just gonna keep reiterating times and places because this is real and I'm struggling to conceive that, Ivanov traveled to Africa and put some human man juice into a trio of chimps. None of these animals ever fell pregnant, thank God, and a frustrated Ivanov Ivanov figured it doesn't work one way, maybe it'll work another. So he changed tactics, instead putting out a notice for Soviet women who were willing to be fertilized with chimp stuff. Something for which he acquired no less than five volunteers of whom I would like to have private conversations with. However, before the experiments could get properly underway, a Stalinist removal of scientists resulted in Ivanov being sent away to Kazakhstan in exile, unable to finish his experiment, where then he died within two years of his arrival. Thank God. Alrighty, that's the end of another video. Thank you, thank you so much for tuning in and I'm glad you enjoyed. Be sure to like and subscribe if you want to see more from us and until next time, start a convo in the comments which one of these scientists was truly the maddest. We know it ain't Madge. <laughs>